Hey, welcome back to the DaVinci Resolve Academy. This is the third lesson in the color series, and today we're talking about secondaries. So unlike primary adjustments, which affect the entire frame globally, secondaries can make more isolated changes based on location or hue, saturation, luminance. So it's an extremely powerful way to fix mistakes or enhance the focus. So let's go ahead and jump inside Resolve and take a look at a couple examples. Okay, so I have my four shots here and I've already set up my color management. They're all in a DaVinci wide intermediate color space. And I've also done some basic exposure and balance adjustments just to kind of match each shot. Now let's say I'm happy with my overall color correction, things match. And now I wanna go through and kind of emphasize parts of the image, maybe even use some of the motivated lighting on set and draw the viewer's eye to specific areas of the frame. So I'm gonna add a new node and then navigate here to the power window panel. Now the power windows will basically limit where all of the corrections on the specific node will live. So you can actually have multiple corrections. You can adjust the gamma, you can adjust the saturation, and put all of that inside of a power window. And you can see we have a few different types of power windows. We can do a rectangle, we can even draw a custom shape, as well as a gradient. So what I want to do in this shot here, I want to kind of use the existing lighting to motivate some color separation and pull our subject out from the frame a little bit. So I'm just gonna come down here and add a gradient wipe. And let's drop some of the blue and the green in our offset. You can see that gives us this nice warm glow. And then we can use this gradient to position it just slightly off camera. And then I can grab this little arrow to soften that out even more. And I'm gonna go ahead and just label this node uh, window light. Now I kinda wanna do the opposite coming from this side. Now rather than just simply adding a new node and doing another gradient from here, Technically, this new power window will be receiving the output from this power window as well. So I might want to use a parallel node instead. So you can hit Alt or Option P to create this parallel mixer node here. And a parallel node is a little different from a standard serial node. Both of these nodes are getting the same output coming from the previous node, and then they get mixed evenly using this parallel mixer node. So in this bottom node here, I'm going to add a second gradient, and this time we're going to drop some of the red and maybe a little bit of the green. You can see that's giving us this nice blue cool tone. And I'm gonna position this one on the other side and soften it out a bit like that. So let's go ahead and relabel this one cool interior. And I'm gonna add a third parallel node into this mixture down here. And with this third one, I'm gonna create kind of a soft vignette around the entire scene here. So I'm gonna go ahead and add an ellipse. Now rather than increasing the gain and kind of brightening up inside of the power window, I'm gonna actually go the opposite way and hit this invert button and drop some of the gain because typically it's better to kind of subtract using your power windows rather than add to something. It's not that you can't ever use power windows to make additive adjustments. It just usually mixes better when you take away from the image. Now, another little tip here about power windows, especially when you're creating a vignette like this, you might think that if you look at this kind of full screen, let's turn off our power window overlay. You might think that this looks okay especially if you're looking at it full screen like this, but you never know where people are gonna be viewing your content. They could be looking at this on a phone or a smaller screen. So what I usually like to do is kind of zoom out and emulate this really small screen because now when I do that, I can actually see that there is a pretty distinct power window. So from here, I'm just gonna soften this until I can't really tell that there is a power window when I'm looking at this small display like this. But obviously if we turn that on and off, we can see that we are affecting the image quite a bit. It's just that it's not super over the top and obvious. And so if we take all three of these and just disable them, you can see we are in fact adding quite a bit of nice color separation and kind of bringing out our subject from the frame. And when we look at this far away, we really can't tell that we've done any kind of obvious adjustments using power windows. We could also use power windows to soften or blur certain areas of the frame, but let me quickly show you some of the limitations with doing this using the standard blur right here in the blur tab. So I'm just gonna increase this blur quite a bit, and then let's go add a inverted ellipse. And I'm gonna stretch this out a little bit and just soften the edges. And notice what's happening to these intermediate areas. It kind of looks unrealistic because what's happening is it's mixing the sharp version of the footage with the blurred version of the footage just using a standard opacity. So there's actually a better way that we can achieve a more realistic blur falloff. So I'm gonna go ahead and reset the standard blur here. 
And if I hold E and drag this node out of the way, this will disconnect it from the rest of the nodes. I'm just going to leave it over here for now. Let's go ahead and add a new node and I'm going to open up the effects panel and search for the tilt shift blur effect. And I'm going to drop that onto this node here. Now with the tilt shift blur, you can see we get a much more realistic fall off on that blur. Instead of mixing using opacity, it actually blurs at a varying degree. We can move this around and even angle this a little bit and you can see we have this nice tilt shift effect. Now if we wanted to have an oval instead of just a linear wipe across the screen, we could change our map source to second input. And as you can see, this node has an additional input here. So I'm just gonna take another output from my source and feed it into our power window that we left hanging out over here. And then I'm gonna feed the output from that power window into the secondary green input here. And you can see it looks very weird right now because this power window isn't creating a standard mat, which is what the tilt shift is expecting. So we can create a node right before the power window and drop the contrast all the way to zero. And then I'm gonna set the pivot to 0.5 and that will give us a perfectly middle gray image coming into the power window. And then in the power window, I can just boost up the low end of the curve, which will effectively create a mat, which again, we're feeding into the tilt shift. And we have that same realism, but now we have the control of a power window. So we can have an oval, we can have a square if we wanted to. And maybe at this point I'd want to kind of soften the edges of my power window, maybe even go back into my tilt shift and just lower the blur amount a little bit. And just to compare this with the other method using the standard blur, you can see the tilt shift gives us a much more realistic and believable result. So power windows are great for restricting adjustments to a specific area in the frame, but the qualifier panel can restrict your adjustments based on a specific range of hue, saturation, and luminance. So I'm just gonna add a new node just for this qualifier. And let's say I wanna brighten up this actor's face a little bit. I could try a power window, but it might kind of affect parts of the background, which I obviously don't want. Now the nice thing about the power window is that you do get this overlay that shows you what part of the image you have selected. But the best way to see your selection with a qualifier is to enable the highlight, which is this button on the top left of the viewer. You can also press Shift H, and with the highlight on, you will be able to see what your grade looks like up until this selected node. That's why it looks like it's back to our regular log state because we've essentially disabled this last Rec. 709 transform. And this may sometimes trip you up if you're ever wondering why your grade changes when you select different nodes. It's likely because you've accidentally enabled the highlight, but it is an extremely useful assistant for viewing a selection. So as I click different parts of the frame, this gray pattern can show me what parts of the image are gonna be limited out of this node's adjustment. Now, if I sample a part of her skin, you can see it's also gonna grab a lot of the background because they share a lot of similarity in terms of hue, saturation, and luminance. So we could fine tune our selection by grabbing these handles here and kind of moving the center point down here. You can also use the controls right here, maybe even soften those handles out a bit like this. And once I'm decently happy with the overall selection here, I can move on to the matte finesse section here and kind of maybe increase the clean white, same with the clean black, blur the radius a touch, and maybe denoise. But you can see no matter what I do, I'm always grabbing too much of this table and the other actor, and I really just want to select the darker part of her face over here. This is where we might want to combine the qualifier with the power window in the same node. So I didn't create a new node, I'm just going to do this on the exact same node here. And if I create an ellipse, you can see these two isolations get combined together. We can kind of use the power window with the qualifier to just select this part of her face. Now, as you probably know, the tracker in Resolve works very well, and so it might be tempting to always reach for the tracker. But the thing is, you don't always need to track your power windows, especially when you're combining them with qualifiers, especially if you're using the same kind of power grade on multiple shots in the same scene. It would be nice if you could avoid the tracker altogether. It's just going to really streamline your whole workflow and make color grading much more efficient. So if I turn off this power window, I already know that I have a pretty big range here to work with. So as long as my power window kind of just lives in this general area where this actor lives across the whole frame, I probably don't even need to track this power window. And so from here, it looks like we have a really good selection. I can turn off my highlight mode and I'm gonna zoom in here and just be really, really gentle and just kind of increase my gamma just a little bit. Now, when I lift the gamma, it's also kind of reducing the contrast a little bit. 
So I might want to lower the lift a little, maybe even hop over to the log wheels and just decrease that shadow because I want to maintain the same level of contrast, but I also kind of want to boost that exposure across her face there. So as we play through that, you can see that we have made a pretty decent improvement on the shot. We haven't done anything too drastic or obvious, and I think that makes it a little bit easier to see the expression on the actor's face. Now here's what I mean about not having to track this power window. I'm going to go ahead and just copy this node, and let's go over to this shot here. So I'm going to add a new node and just paste this face light node, and let's check out our power window, shift H again to bring up our highlight mode. And all I really need to do is kind of reshape this power window. And you can see even though the shot is handheld, our power window doesn't really need to be tracked. And so if we had a bunch of these shots in the same scene, this could really save us a whole lot of time not having to track every single power window. Okay, so we talked about some broad scope secondary adjustments using some very large power windows. We went a little bit more specific combining qualifiers with the power window. Now let's talk about some of the more granular adjustments you can make with your secondary tools. Now as I look at this shot, one thing that stands out to me is these very very red objects here on the desk, this marker in her hand. Now there's a bunch of different ways that we could handle this. Let me go ahead and add a new note here. I could, for example, go into my hue versus saturation and let's just sample a portion of that really bright red color here. And that's gonna drop an anchor point here on my red within the spectrum. And I can go ahead and drop that saturation. And that does take care of those very bright reds, but it's also doing a little bit to their skin here. So we could try to tighten that selection up using these neighboring anchor points but we actually have more precise controls using the qualifier once again. So I'm gonna reset this node. Let's hop over here to the qualifiers. Now, as I mentioned before, the default qualifier is gonna look for hue, saturation, and luminance. Let me go ahead and put this into highlight mode again. Now this time, I'm gonna go ahead and select part of that red color here. And right away, you can see that it is actually selecting a lot of the skin tone, a lot of this back wall over here. And so we could try to, you know, fine tune this using our sliders here. We can also soften it out. Looks like it's grabbing too much of the dark end. So I'll try to bring up some of that luminance selection. And you can see this is pretty tricky to work with. It's kind of getting uh, a lot of the frame that I don't necessarily want. So you might try to combine the qualifier with the hue versus sat curve, just like we did with the power window in the qualifier. But as you can see, no matter what I try, we're always grabbing too much of the skin because they share too much in common in terms of hue. So I actually want to use this as an opportunity to show you some of the alternative methods we can use within the qualifier. If you look in the top right inside the qualifier, you see there are four modes. So the standard HSL mode is what we used before. We also have this RGB mode, which will kind of mix the red, green, and blue values. But if you go all the way to the right, there's actually this 3D keyer built right into the qualifier. And this is by far the most precise method for qualifications. So as you saw before, let me just show you one more time. With the regular HSL qualifier, if I just simply click this red cap here, you can see everything that's being selected. Let me reset that, do the exact same thing with the 3D keyer, watch this. Look at that, it only selects the cap, part of the red stapler, areas over here, these pens. It doesn't get any of the skin tone, any of the back wall, anything like that, and I didn't have to fine tune my selection. And of course, if we needed to, we could still fine tune the selection. So we've got our tolerance slider right here and our softness right here. And the best way to think about this, the tolerance is pretty much the same as the width right here on your hue slider. So your width is basically like the tolerance and the softness is of course identical to the softness on this slider here. So we can kind of widen this range a little bit. See, as I increase that, we're getting a little bit more of that skin, and we can also soften the edges of that range like this. And the cool thing about the 3D qualifier is you can also subtractively qualify. So you can switch this to this negative selection here, now I'm just gonna intentionally widen the threshold a little bit to grab maybe too much of the skin here. And now as I drag through this person's face, you can see that it's eliminating that portion of our selection. And it's adding to this list here. We can see these are positive selections. This one is a negative selection. So if I continue, we have a new negative selection. 
and maybe I want to go ahead and add a little bit more of that marker. Now we've got another positive selection and I can go through here and delete specific strokes if I made a mistake, which just makes this a lot easier to work with compared to the standard qualifier, especially when you're trying to get very precise qualifications. And you also have four different modes, soft, flat, and tight, basically all work the same way with varying degrees of precision. And then you have Luma, which is of course based on the brightness. So usually I like to leave mine on flat here. And if you need to adjust the selected hue, you do have these X and Y sliders right here. You can see as we adjust this, our selection kind of moves around this area. You can also rotate around the center using this angle slider right there. You can reset them by double clicking. And just like the standard qualifier, we still can kind of fine tune the mat here and kind of blur the edge, maybe even denoise slightly. And let's turn off our highlight mode. And now I'm gonna go back to my hue versus sat and just add a pretty broad red anchor point here and just drop the saturation a little bit. And now you can see, even if I push it really far, it doesn't affect anything in the skin tones in the back wall at all. So this can be a little bit quicker when you're trying to make these very precise selections, these very precise qualifications. It can be a really nice way to kind of just duck down some of those overly saturated areas without having to spend too long trying to qualify and fine tune your selection. So this is one of the biggest reasons why so many professional colorists have made DaVinci Resolve their weapon of choice. It has some of the most powerful secondary tools available and it's really incredible what a few tweaks to certain hues or areas in the shot can do for the overall look and feel. It's really easy to go too far with this though, so I like to kind of take a break, let my eyes rest, and come back and watch the whole thing in context to see if anything jumps out at me, and if it does, you can always dial back your settings. So that's it for this lesson. Thank you for watching. In the next lesson, we're going to talk about color contrast, which is kind of piggybacking off of some of the concepts we went over in this lesson. So I hope you look forward to that. I really do appreciate you for watching. We'll see you in the next one.